Welcome. This is the May 14th Jalen Zones production user call. We have Jan, Mohammed, Nick, Dan, Antrenig, and myself, Michael, so far. And BSD Can is right around the corner, such that I want to get topics out this week on the various calls about things to discuss in the hallway track, in the developer summit, you name it. Uh, one key thing, the FreeBSD Developer Summit is no longer, at least in this case for Ottawa, no longer invitation only, but even the most core people didn't know that. So that's been fixed. Thank you, Colin, for updating the wiki to change the kind of impression given there. We were just a second ago talking about FreeBSD on GitHub in general, and specifically the topic that Rod brought up last week, which was the proposal to default if config to CIDR notation. And that I would say brought up a long overdue discussion, which is quite good. And it took place in a, I guess, primarily on the PR and in the Arch mailing list. So the bulk of it is here and you can see all sorts of, sorts of folks chime in and welcome Jamie. Yes, you made it awesome. So I will bang out this topic and allow you to catch us up. But for those who wish to celebrate, I will put this PR, not to be confused with a PR, a problem report in the chat. So uh, it's it's a doozy of a conversation. I'm glad it brought up like, oh, is this you know uh, the right way to fix it? Is it so easy to fix in your environment that you can, well, fix it in the first place in your environment so there, we wouldn't even need the change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But Jamie, would you like to update us on what's been going on since you last joined? <laughs> As if I have been uh, working on things. Aww. No, no. I. What has kept me away from these meetings has really kind of kept me away from, or at least similar to the stuff that's kept me away, has kept me away from getting anything done at all so unfortunately this is zero updates this is me just getting back into stuff welcome back and i'm curious have you seen any fallout from your i think it was dash c cleanup flag last we heard from you um none at all excellent that luckily and, it's a fairly well, trivial can, change well yeah but you never know the code which is why yep. i'm so happy that i didn't have to untangle the state uh, tracking to implement it myself. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. Sure. Uh, just about every regression is a trivial change. So I'm glad that's a new feature that's working great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for what it's worth, and... do you have anything on your roadmap for the remainder of the year? Um, the descriptors, getting back to the descriptors. I put in the initial thing that just has descriptors but doesn't use them yet. And I need to, you know, actually, uh, get the differential in to make them useful. Awesome. Um, Jamie? Yes. I looked at it, but then it, uh, the change uh, for pulling the system call stops out of uh, libc into its own library broke yes. uh, it for me. So and I don't know if you've gotten around to uh, rebasing your patch, basically. No, I haven't done that. I've, I've seen the need for it, yes. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, yeah, otherwise, uh, this is a hurdle for anyone wanting to track it that you either would have to forward port it yourself or uh, do whatever development you want on the few uh, revisions between the last modification you uploaded and the change going into current. So this, unless it gets rebased, uh, this feature is uh, under dire threat of getting abandoned by the, just the development pace. Yeah. Yes, that, that's the first thing to do, right, before before adding new features is to uh, yeah, make it work again at all. And the other question, I had, if I remember correctly, you used basically positive numbers for jail descriptors and negative ones as an ugly inbound signaling to request resource allocation. Did I understand that correctly? That um, you... I, I use a negative number as yeah a way of saying this is not a jail descriptor. I would like to receive a jail descriptor because jail descriptors are unusual 
they are different from most jail parameters in that they can actually be set when you are setting jail parameters, because that's how you can get a descriptor at the moment of creating a jail, which is a necessary part of the timeline. Yeah, because of course, um, so uh, because uh, you, so if I understand the code card, your intent is that you uh, use the jail set system call to create these kinds of jails? Yes. With the jail create flag? Yes. Um, and one of the things is that jail set has a return value. Mm -hmm. And so far, the return value from jail set is uh, the jail ID. And I wonder if it would make sense to uh, have a flag instead to return the uh, jail descriptor instead of the ID. There. So that the return value would still be the your return value and you would just set a flag and like, don't give return me the jail ID, but return me the uh, jail ID, uh, sorry, the jail descriptor. I could do that, yes, but I don't know that I, I want to change that. I mean, if I have to have a parameter anyway that says change the return value, it, it seems I might as well just have, have a parameter that says put the ID here. Yeah, well, it's, it's just so uh, my brain has problems with the concept of negative number means please put in a positive number. And it's so easy to miss the check because you're checking an in-out parameter instead of uh, a return value for errors. Yeah. Because oh, have you decided what happens when basically the create inserting the file descriptor uh, into the process uh, file descriptor table fails, but the jail has already been created? That will not happen. The um, if inserting the file descriptor fails, the jail creation fails. Okay. Even if the, uh, I think I, I might even have it before the jail was created, but it is definitely before the jail is mm -hmm. put into a fully active state. Okay. So you will not get a jail without. So you, you will never be able to observe uh a state where because of your, let's say, you set your file descriptor limit for your process to zero, then run jail set, jail create, give me a file descriptor, and right. we'll just, okay. So that state is unobservable. Right. Now, a, a cost of that is that it is possible for the file descriptor to be, or necessary in that case, for the file descriptor to be created before the jail is visible. And while the user process is not told, at least in that thread, about the creation of that file descriptor, because it's still waiting on the system call. Okay, that's uh... another thread to see that descriptor, and it would be a jail descriptor that points to nothing. And the worst that would happen there is if they try to use it, it would get an error code because it points to nothing. Um, just crazy corner case uh, questions. What happens yeah, no, when this file descriptor, which exists but is not yet bound to a jail, mm -hmm. is then sent to another process or fork? If a process forks and a child inherits such a uh, descriptor, and then it gets later bound uh, to a specific jail, is it where is the basically the capability stored? Is, is it like with a real file or is there a problem there with, with this new file descriptor type? I that... haven't run that case, but it, you know, the way I understand it to work is you use the file descriptor before it's ready and you will just get, I don't remember the error code, but uh, and At least the... that's fine. But then you use it after the jail is created and it is exactly as if you were past that file descriptor after the jail was so, created. It would be a working descriptor. At that because um, we have this general purpose, give me a unusual type of file descriptor system call to create things like uh, event FDs and so on. Uh -huh. um, 
already, so you wouldn't have to implement a new system call for it. And I'm wondering if it, with all the corner cases you've already uh, acknowledged have to exist in the corner code, wouldn't it make sense that you have, can uh, use the first system call to create an unbound J descriptor, and then you can once uh, bind it to a jail, or just, and that's it? So that you would have to pre-allocate an unbound file descriptor similar to an unbound socket, and then you give it in a valid file descriptor, which is not yet attached to a jail. I hadn't thought of that flow. I suppose it could be done. Because I'm not sure that that is preferable to it normally being created as part of the system call, though. The, the advantage I see is that uh, the, you have fewer um, error cases, and it's it's a more linear code flow than this, oh, no, now I have to backtrack and undo things. Yeah, well, the... Uh, if you ever look at the jail set system call code, it's full of backtracks and yeah. bail points. And, and so this is just becomes one of them. Um, but it keeps the user user program flow cleaner in that uh, you don't have to do two things, two different system calls to create one result. Um, but you, these are different things. So, Right now, what you're getting is uh, you're getting a descriptor, and then you're using it similar to how you would create a socket and then connect it. Yeah, I, I prefer it's... getting a descriptor when you use it, similar to how you open a file. You do not create a file descriptor and then say, here's the file name I want to attach to it. Well, it depends on the file descriptor type. You can do that for some... Things like, for example, with an uh, MQ, I think you uh, can have an MQ attach after it has already been created. Yes. Uh, and I think with uh, shared memory segments as well with uh, the memfds, that you can assign a name to them, even if their name the namespace isn't part of the file system namespace, uh, really. And all of the sockets work like that too, but if you yeah. if you think that it's not full of corner cases, I'm just... <laughs> I, I think it's not, and uh, I have to admit that one advantage I see in the way I'm doing it now is it's already the way I'm doing it now. <laughs> if you've already gotten that working, fine. And it's just I was stumbling over the code reading it and moving up and down. Yeah. It's been uh, at least two months, so yeah. I would have to read it again. Yep, yeah. One of the things I really need to do is just look at my pages long jail set function and turn it into something readable someday. Yep. Does anyone that would know? Really... Go ahead. That would really make the code more approachable, even if you add the odd bug doing that. Because once you've refactored it and debugged it again, the code is a lot more maintainable. Yep. Does well, anyone else have questions about jail descriptors and the architecture that's emerging? Um, oh, yes, um, not really jail descriptor, but process uh, management related. And that is, um, with all the OCI stuff and process management with sub creepers and so on, the problem is if it just process, uh, basically sessions, uh, process groups, uh, even sub repos are kind of voluntary uh, and processes can escape them. Um, but with jails or in Linux with C groups, you can't escape this kind of process management, which is why it's uh, superior for use with untrusted um, processes, for example, the contents of a jail. But um, would you be open to adding the often mentioned button so far never fully implemented 
uh, basically tracking only jail where you can disable all the restrictions, potentially even allowing this kind of process to still load kernel modules and so on so that you could use it basically an outer jail only for process tracking and then an inner one uh, for the actual security boundary. Because it would also help with uh, process management. Um, yeah, I'm not against that, but I have seen pushback from uh, other kernel people about anything where a, a jail misses some of the uh, security aspects. And I, I don't think there would be buy-in on it. Yeah. I see that the, the, this will probably start a bike shedding discussion, uh, but I hope that the argument that um, we kind of need this to eventually expose this functionality through the Linux uh, ABI module, so just so that we can run more and more software or that the Linux uh, ABI module stays relevant because more and more software in Linux starts using these equivalent features, which right now FreeBSD does not expose to user space as an API. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can see that. But um, really, I'm just, I'm not the one who needs to be convinced of this. <laughs> okay, so you wouldn't be the one blocking it at least. Right. <laughs> Anything else on that? Well, questions for Jamie. Welcome back, Jamie. And one quick point. Yes, uh, the FreeBSD GitHub repo does support ports and other things, and there's activity there as soon as recently as yesterday. Welcome, Mark. Is this your first call? And if so, would you like to briefly introduce yourself, Mr. Canadian in Ontario, Ontario, who can't make it to be oh, okay. can? <laughs> uh, yeah, Mark Lapointe. Um, you know, general developer, uh, networks, network security. Um, previously worked at Akamai via Prolexic. Um, but yeah, I attended a few conferences, but yeah, this is the first time I've actually uh, managed to capture, uh, get on this call. Do you have any or questions any... for the call? Uh, not immediately. I was going to be, uh, I was planning on just being a wallflower for the moment. That's just fine. That's just fine. We, we have a few of those present. Well, cool. Welcome and feel free to jump in with anything. Yeah, um, yeah. Like I have already kind of made a comment to, in general. Granted, it's probably highfalutin at the moment, but oh, which is know, since, um, ultimately, we need, I, I think FreeBSD needs to, you know, the jail environment needs to grow so that we got reusability, uh, just like Docker images. But, um, but you know, don't have necessarily have to do it that way. And I know things are obviously a bit different between uh jails and docker but you know maybe like a repo with scripts or something or recipes that uh we can that are readily reusable templates or something to uh really mature this environment further as docker and kubernetes is being used today have you been following doug rabson's work on these calls and otherwise uh no i have not heard he's of doing some really good container work so maybe just on your, at your leisure, scroll down in the dock and uh, if, um, um, work with um, OCI compatible runtimes is also uh, relevant. Uh, maybe uh, does anyone have the link for him? With the uh, yep, one second reviews. Yeah. So yeah, oh, and he's actually he ha he's taking feedback through pull requests. Yep. So yeah, if you've got that, drop in the chat. Um, anyway, he's he's very actively taking your concerns into consideration. Shall we move on? Antrenig, I've been na nagging you about Jailer and you've been nagging me to use it. Uh, do you have any news in general about it? And have you done anything more to sprout VM support? Mr. Muted.
All right, a corner of you, maybe you've had a call come in. That's related to Anchenig. Uh, Jan, you inadvertently discovered a form of process supervision. No, that briefly. wasn't back, and I think that. Okay. That, that I, it's that uh, I was reading from a pipe, and uh, the process which owned the pipe spawned demon child processes, which did not close standard uh, out in standard error. Uh, and because of that, the pipe was never closed for writing. And as such, there was never an end of uh, stream on the pipe. So uh, I had to uh, build another signaling mechanism in to uh, handle that case. Cool. And that's done now. OK, cool. Um... Question in general, uh, there has been forwarding in FreeBSD forever, and uh, Entrenig noticed perhaps a 20% performance hit. Has anyone noticed that? There's, you know, this is control that enables it. It's like, oh, that's what you do for NAT and other goody stuff. 20% uh, uh, performance hit when you do what? Enable you simply forwarding. enable forwarding, and it impacts the network stack across the board. And of course, you can chime in in about does. two minutes. Uh, have you ever quantified that overhead? No, not really, because I'm seldom in a position where I can choose whether to uh, enable it or not. I either have to use it or not. Correct. Uh, I'd be curious when if you do, it's, it's been optimized uh, over the last decade or so. Yeah, but some optimizations uh, in the stack, basically, the stack has to consider more uh, cases when it is not just the host. So mm -hmm. it is to be expected that the overhead per packet increases. No question. Cool. So 20% doesn't shock me. Uh, there may be an opportunity to identify with the finer grained things so that you could say, OK, unless you have done this or that or the other, you can kind of skip over parts of the routing uh, so that the cost goes down of so that just enabling the CCTL is the, the, the part, but yeah, suddenly you have to be, be find out if it's a local address uh, or if it's a routed address. And then if it's routed, you have to actually route it and not just discard it. So yeah, there's more work, but, and maybe that the opposite has already been done, basically that there are a bunch of fast paths which then get disabled when a uh, packet forwarding is enabled because suddenly the, you can no longer skip these steps. So, yeah. Interesting. Cool. The oh, other ahead. argument is that uh, if you're in a position to decide between bridging and forwarding that but the IP routing is oftentimes still faster and uh, more flexible than just uh, doing some kind of layer to uh, stuff underneath the IP stack. Hmm. So that's at least my observation that that was in FreeBSD 13 last that I checked it, and I don't know if 14 changed the relative overhead. Cool. Yeah, just, and for what it's worth, can you envision what tools would allow you to visualize, be it with flame graphs or otherwise, the behavior of the forwarding? Is that a PMC question, is that a... Okay. Question? What do you want? You would you have to use a, a hardware-assisted performance uh, monitoring counters to uh, not have too much of a probe effect. By the fact, yeah, want... the tool itself would slow things down, eh? Yeah, and especially it would change what's the expensive part. Good point, cool. Potentially, because if you have lots of functions where you suddenly add tons of uh, active detrace probes at the function boundaries, uh, just so that you do basically the, the equivalent of an old uh, function boundary based uh, sampling instead of a, um, yeah, instead of a random uh, sampling based uh, profile, then you would have the problem that you're adding a significant probe effect. Um, yeah, so you need hardware uh, with proper performance counter support in software, and then uh, the patients to use it if you really want to dig down, if you just want to quantify the behavior, 
you don't have to measure where you're spending your time. You only have to basically measure the throughput. That's a lot easier to do. And you only need basically network stack torture tests. Um, let's how fast is one iper three connection? How fast are ten thousand concurrent uh, yep. send files in uh, Nginx? To uh, what happens when I have forward one flow, ten flows, hundred or ten thousand flows? Yeah. Antonik is back. Antonik, I don't know if you caught any of this. I brought up the whole notion of forwarding overhead. And yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, made the point that maybe it could be slightly more fine grained to like, you know, if it's not doing IPv6, don't even bother executing code paths related to it. But do you have any context that got us to this conversation? Yes, yes. Uh, many of you remember our fat server, the massive machine. So we, what we, what we do there is uh, one of the NICs is on the host and the other NIC is the PCI pass through to the uh, guest. And historically, you know, there's no, you know, bridging or anything. We just used it as is, and we were able to achieve 9.9 .9 gigabit per second very easily. Um, and then one of the scientists asked for a PostgreSQL instance. And like a sane person, I created a jail on the host, which means now I needed bridging, right? And uh, I enabled, I, I did the bridging and then I configured everything as it should be thanks to Jan's blog posts of proper bridging setups. Um, and of course, I also needed to enable um, IP forward. And as soon as I did that, it dropped drastically to like six point something. It could barely reach seven. Uh, um, and then, yes, go on. You shouldn't have to do that uh, if you are only doing layer two forwarding. You don't have to enable IP forwarding to for bridging. Um, if you have a VNet enabled jail, at least. Yes. That, that was the first step. The first step was doing only bridging. We were hit with the bridge limitations. Yes, so because I, yeah. um, to uh, use bridging on a NIC, you have to disable various offloading engines in a modern yes. NIC so that yes. you get an unmodified view at each packet for the bridge to forward. You can't yes. do uh, any form of firmware driver level uh, Aggregation, yes. deaggregation of segments. Yes. And then I thought, okay, you know what? If bridging has these kind of uh, bottlenecks, I'll just go back to the routing model. So basically, uh, no bridge, but one of the e pairs has an IP, the other part of the e pair has the other end of the IP. And we went back to that. And for external access, I used the uh, routing, which means now I needed to enable forwarding. And even at that point, we also got the hit. Uh, apologies, the bridge was much, 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 much lower. It was like lower than uh, five gigabit per second. The with with IP forwarding, we got around six point something seven max. So I'm like, oh, like I'm I'm getting easily uh, some hits there, you know. So with bridging, it was less than five gigabit per second, and with no bridging but only forwarding, we got around six point something. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, so that this was, and this is very easily replicable, uh, rep replicatable, repl reprodu reproducible, reproducible, yeah, okay. <laughs> reproducible scenario, you know, like uh, I'm having an upgrade this weekend. I can easily do like a benchmark there if anyone has any kind of debug modes that I should enable for testing. I, and I, I kept doing it multiple times to make sure that like this is actually the problem. You know, I enabled, disabled, changed, config. Oh, now it's dropping. And in our case, it was very uh, visible because we use a lot of NFSs. Uh, and like, oh, now everything is like lagging because mm. user home directories are not loading properly. So uh, we went back to... We went back to the idea, okay, an NFS server should be only serving. Now... For yeah. me, this was not much of an issue. We have a proper data room where I just could move the Postgre to an Omni OS and like be fine there. And we didn't need you know 10 gigabit on the Postgre anyway. But this is a huge problem where people come and say, "Hey, my TrueNAS slash FreeNAS is having an issue serving NFS when I have a Plex jail running because that's a very common scenario, right? They have." Mm -hmm. 
uh, all of their media files in um, their true NAS. And then they're like, okay, I want to serve this to my TV. So they install um, a Plex in a jail and then they mount the, or like NullFS mount, the, um, the data sets into the Plex. And then they're like, oh, now everything is slow. Right. So uh, now I, I told my team if something on FreeBSD is supposed to be serving, it's only serving, nothing else. Uh, you want to use Postgres on that data set, do an FS mount to another server, do, 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 keep the application and the ser serving separate in this case, which is a very common practice from the 2000s. But like we didn't expect that much of a hit with IP forwarding equals one. That, that, that's my point. Um, we did not expect that. Yeah. Anthony? Yes. Um, multiple uh, ideas. First, uh, you could you uh, probably avoid uh, the impact on the host network stack by using alias based jails. So, uh, unless you really have to do bridging or nothing or routing, you can just yep. on the same um, subnet. Put in a uh, uh, slash 32 or slash 128 yep. for yep. jail and then put that on. And then you don't have to enable uh, forwarding unless you have to do not on the host, which mm -hmm. in a proper server environment you shouldn't have to do. And mm -hmm. not a slash uh, 28, a slash 32 or a slash 128. Yes. Uh, but you could have, let's say, a slash 28 IPv4 prefix. For for your server, and then you put mm -hmm. the jails in there uh, as a slash 32. And that's actually a very cool idea. I totally forgot it's about the traditional way to yeah. Jails. the good old days. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, um, uh, I'm thinking because, like, see, see, the problem with VNet jails, sorry, non VNet jails is. You have to make sure that applications understand this because some applications, MySQL is very common with this, by the way, uh, is that, oh, I don't see 127001. I'm just going to crash now. I think they fixed it. Um, no, uh, the behavior is a bit more clever, but in some cases insidious. Mm -hmm. And that is that the inside a jail context, when the jail process uh, basically attempts to bind to the loopback address. Mm -hmm. Instead, it gets bound to the primary IP address of that family for the jail, if it's in alias mode. So uh, that can mean that uh, something like MySQL binds to 127.0.0.1. And in reality, it's bound to the external public IPv4 address hanging naked in the internet. And that's the worst case, but the best case is that even if an application uh, insists on binding to the loopback, you can add multiple IP addresses to the jail, and the first one per IP address you added will be the one which gets mapped to the loopback. And so yeah, so you can do something like the yeah, jail binds to 127.0.0.1. Uh, and in reality, yeah, exactly. And in reality, you have a whole slash eight to place it in, mm -hmm. uh, even if it's hard coded in the source code and you only have the executable. Um, the other options you you have, if I remember correctly, you have a pretty acceptable network card in that box, uh, so you could just use uh, virtual functions without PCI pass through, put them yes. in the non pass through mode, and if your VNet jail uh, its own uh, virtual function of your physical NIC. Yep, yep. The, there the overhead depends on the combination of um, driver um, firmware hardware. So it can be basically unmeasurable for uh, anything but tiny packets so that you can easily run at line rate. And the nice thing is that the whole disable offloading features should, unless it's tied together somewhere in the NIC, uh, be per virtual interface so that you, the host can still run with full offloading and the jail too. And you could even have a network jail 
uh, which then contains the bridge and puts its virtual function in the less than perfect uh, the performant uh, configuration for a bridged stuff, and then run other jails uh, attached to that bridge via ePath. So you can script all of that. Uh, most of it would make sense to put in the exec.created uh, hook, where you already have the jail, and thereby it's VNet. Mm -hmm. uh, to move interfaces into it, but there's no process in there. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, Jailer does this automatically. You know, in Jailer, you can say, like, if you want an EPR mm -hmm. bridge mode, or if you want to pass any random interface to it, or if you want to create on top of an interface, which is, you know. And, and, and there's also sure. the one that I, I think no one uses called the inherit model, not the new model. Oh, uh, yeah. Completely. I tend to uh, use that. If I yeah. use an outer jail uh, for things, where, so that if I have a parent, which only basic, which is kind of like, like just a management helper for the host and mm -hmm. not part of the untrusted execution model. And the other mm -hmm. part where the inherit is useful, if you, for example, I'm using that for package base, so that the, yes. the package base uh, jail.com switch pulls in the packets exactly, uh, and yes. it stores that, can just use that. Um, and I can also use the uh, pre-start or whatever, or prepare hook to mm -hmm. uh, copy the resolve conf and maybe even the ETC hosts from the uh, um, host yep. into the uh, inherit jail. And, uh, and yeah, I might be wrong, but I think- do want to do that. I think Pudriel also uses it, uh, right? Sorry. I think Poudrier also uses it, right, when building? Yes, uh, for the fetchers. Yep, yep, yep. The, okay. the builders yeah. run uh, intentionally without networking. That's yeah. the last mode, which even fewer use. Uh, the but which, which mode? Which could be uh, the one where you disable IPv4 and IPv6. Oh, yes, yes. It's like no um, networking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is to make uh, keep the ports makes files honest so that they don't uh, <laughs> accidentally depend on uh, network access like, oh, if, run this uh, giant CMake script. Whoops, it downloads some blobs from uh, GitHub uh, in the build phase instead of in the fetch phase. So <laughs> many, so many, so many uh, uh, software. Mm -hmm does that actually especially with the uh, like the npm steps you know yeah that's one of to... the reasons why it yeah hard to uh, turn uh, no npm packages into ports that they inherently do all of that crap yeah you don't have a split basically fetch and build phase and that it's build one module to completion then the next one and so on mm -hmm. um so what and then everything is changing twice a day. Hmm. And But uh, and jail without networking could be very useful for your Postgres server. You can do mm -hmm. it like this. You run a jail, which doesn't have to be completely isolated, but it could run without an, an IP stack or even IPv4 or IPv6 at all. Okay. And you can instruct... Uh, Postgres to bind only a Unix socket. Okay. Then on the host, you run uh, any kind of application which can basically forward TCP to Unix socket. Something oh, like, like socket. Okay proxy or so on. And yeah. you can then have a null FS with the sockets in it. Of course. And mount that uh, into the jail. So the host mounts a null FS of a shared directory. And mm -hmm. then you put the socket in there, and HA proxy will connect to that. Yes, that's another that, that good use also... for, for child yep. jails. Yep, that's that's um, actually a very good point. Yes. What's neat? What you can do with this is you can ha do the opposite on the target system, so that you have a trusted, uh, let's say, S pipe D uh, tunnel between two jails on potentially completely different systems. And they both get to use Unix sockets. So 
you don't have to deal with passwords because what's really authenticated is the um, channel and the Postgres server sees the user ID of the tunnel process. So if you want to have multiple users for your Postgres server, each one would have to have one user ID. But then you can get to just pretend that everything is local and everyone has a unique user ID and you don't have to do with secrets management other than the public key crypto for something like uh, S-Tunnel or s -Pipe D. Uh, this is everything everything feels local to the application because almost every Postgres uh, using application can be configured to talk to the local Postgres server. Yes. And it will just look for the socket somewhere in slash tem uh, and then the port number. This S pipe D model also seems interesting as a, a method for communicating between um, jailer CTL and jailer in the future. You know, because currently jailer CTL just executes commands over SSH, mm -hmm. which is like a very bad idea. You can easily do shell uh, injection um, in there. Uh, but like having S pipe do, D. Mm -hmm. You can also use SSH, SSH as your uh, tunnel because SSH can also operate as a Unix socket to Unix socket tunnel. And you can restrict it on the server side to not allow arbitrary commands, but only to operate as this kind of forwarding proxy. Oh, yeah, that's that's the piece then that... Then you get uh, to piggyback uh, on your yep. existing SSH uh, yeah. authentication. Yeah, that, that's, that's the piece that I think like Gti uses where like the Git user only executes the Git command, right? No, you wouldn't even get to execute arbitrary commands because potentially Git is so flexible that you can use, for example, Git hooks. If you're not careful, you put hooks in there and then yeah, or Got other it. things. So a Git shell is not a really secure isolation, which is why you put it in a jail. <laughs> so yeah. yeah Jan, is there idea sense. number three or just those two? Any ideas? So, so, uh, so uh, the uh, ideas uh, would be aliasing uh, yeah. based network configuration. The second one mm -hmm. is not no network configuration. but virtual functions yeah. so mm -hmm. that you have multiple physical-ish uh, interfaces. Physical yeah, so that you can give the virtual function of your physical NIC to the VNet enabled jail. And then neither of them has to act as a software bridge or a software router. Mm -hmm. Instead, you expect your... Uh, hopefully server great Nick to be able to do what it's marketed as at line rate. That's all documented and the last in the handbook, one, right? Uh, should be uh, not at, as, um, at least in the FreeBSD journal about PCI password. Um, well, yeah, I mean, all of this. And all of the next uh, advantage is that would be to potentially not have any networking, but more realistically, not put the bridged or routed network in the fast path. Uh, instead, you run a TCP uh, to Unix socket proxy on the host or in a jail running with inherit networking. And then uh, have it forward the stream instead of the uh, individual packets. That way you uh, can keep using all of the fancy um, offloading on a good server nick up to and including uh, in kernel TLS on a total TCP IP offloading engine. But, yeah. Cool. Anything else related to that? There's idea three somewhere in there. Cool. Uh, I mean, we, we did think about all the solutions. Yep. But we basically bypassed the problem, which is clearly when you enable IP forwarding equals one, there is some kind of a performance hit. And uh, uh, I, I have some basic knowledge on how to debug this, like how to uh, uh, maybe like generate a flame graph of the kernel or something like that to figure out where it's spending most of its time. Uh, but if anyone has any ideas, 
uh, on how to debug this properly. I would love to hear because I mean I have I have a whole weekend where I can play around with the server without bothering the users, and uh, I would be happy to t test this and see where the exact performance hits are coming from. Um, I'm surprised and, and... that you're. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm surprised that you're actually seeing that much of a throughput drop instead of just an increased CPU, uh, CPU utilization hmm. because ah. the CPU should have a, a high enough single thread throughput to even if there are no, basically non parallelized parts in there and they definitely are in those code paths but they, it should perform well enough to uh, hit 10 gigabits for uh, NFS style traffic Mm -hmm. because NFS, yeah, is a bit unusual because it's both RPC and uh, very much high bandwidth and very bursty. Mm -hmm. It's not like downloading your Linux ISO collection. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, it's, you should be able to at least for things like iPerf free or something, to easily push uh, 10 gig through that system you've described a while ago. Yeah, I, it, it, this has been bothering me. Like, um, I mean, I, I, I absolutely love the uh, EPR bridge model, for example, right? But it's really sad that when you use that, there are some very, very, very clear performance hits, you know? And mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I obviously don't have the knowledge to fix it. But uh, I guess with more reporting from the users, we can get to a scenario where the uh, people who know how to fix it will be able to fix it, I guess. Um, so, last I tinkered with that was in 13.1 or 13.0. And it turned out that uh, the work to add basically proper SMP support to the bridge really paid off and the bridge itself mm -hmm. can sustain far more than 10 gigabits total mm -hmm. throughput through the bridge and make efficient use of multiple cores, but an individual ePair interface can't. It yes. used to be that you had one thread shuffling the, uh, the frames between the different uh, VNets, the host and the jail, for example, um, back and forth, and that this became the bottleneck. Potentially, you could mess with the net ISR threading model to maybe mm -hmm. do not use direct dispatch, but use uh, the thread pool delayed dispatch model, which on good Nix has been kind of deprecated, but maybe it's the right one to use for software interfaces like this. But again, that mm -hmm. would be a global kernel level setting, which would really affect the whole kernel of which part of the network stack gets executed on that, which kernel mm -hmm. thread or thread pool. So it wouldn't be per jail. It would be really a host global setting. Um, so you would have to be careful tuning with that, that it, so that it doesn't pessimize for an average yeah. use case you care about. Yeah. But it's possible that there is a better configuration or that it still is the case in 14 that the ePair is still basically your bottleneck. Um, the test there would be to spin up multiple uh, jails and load them at the same time and see if the total system throughput uh, goes up or not. Yeah, this is this is really spin up this four is, jails, uh, spin up four load tests. Yeah, this is really bothering. And and also test the throughput uh, on the between uh, both the external test machine and the host, the external test machine and one or more jails, and the ex the host and the jail. And the jails are basically the outside network. So you have to you have to differentiate between virtual to and external virtual to host uh, communication in both directions. 
and potentially also virtual to virtual if you have two two jets talking to each other over the bridge. Yeah, I was I was gonna say that this is a kind of disappointing because on on Illumos, when we're doing zone to zone on the same machine, we're easily getting like you know twenty twenty five gigabit per second. Uh, you speeds. will get the same uh, on alias based jails, even more potentially. Yeah, I I, I will try that for sure uh, on the same machine, like just two uh, alias based uh, machines. Sorry, alias based jails, and see what happens. But uh, but in case of uh, well, in case of Illumos, they they are actual you know uh, complete network stacks. So yeah. they they have all of the benefits of our vnet jails and all the speeds of our alias based jails you know well you could use that yes, weekend but... to port crossbow low but i'm thumbs <laughs> that's the tongue-in-cheek answer i was um holding back and they're You're getting welcome. that because they had a whole team of experienced network kernel hackers working for three to five years depending on which slide deck you can dig out from uh, the Internet Archive. You mean uh, working that, not and, free? No, a, a team of full-time kernel developers with network and performance background. So that oh. you have, and you don't just have the Crossbow. Crossbow is only the crowning. The, the other thing is, I think, called the Fire Engine underneath. And then I the haven't whole heard that one. Good of enough. the... Um, hmm? I hadn't heard of that uh, one. Go ahead. The other part is that, if I understand it correctly, uh, inside of Solaris uh, 9 and 10, there was a bunch of big changes during that time frame where they reorganized how drivers look to the current of the API so that basically the driver doesn't provide a monolithic uh, network interface, but mm -hmm. There's the a port with receive buffers and queues and so on, so that you can have your generic. And then uh, the next layer, the virtual uh, Ethernet interface. Then, uh, as long as you have hardware resources, uh, and you can even use this for hardware assisted uh, rate limiting and so on. So you could say, like, this little jail should only get a one gig or two gig um, virtual Ethernet port. And yes. then you use the hardware packet pacing on the NIC to uh, slow down the traffic to that rate mm -hmm. without having to wake up the CPU each time, which is really nice if you have all the drivers we work to do that. If you only, if you have paid developers and care about 10 different network chips uh, in total, you can do that mm, easily. It's a bit harder when you don't have the uh, paid full-time staff uh, and you care about more than a dozen network chips working. Yeah. Uh, Welcome, I mean... Rod, our packet pusher extraordinaire. Yes, Sanchez? <laughs> yep. He's catching I up. See, you must have talked about my set of experimental tweaks. They're not experimental tweaks. They're just overdue increasing of in-flight buffering. No, you're next. We do dove into the fact that Entredic noticed that forwarding has a pretty solid 20% performance hit, and we we're wondering if that could be like finer grain such that if you're not exercising a certain aspect of networking could the forwarding not worry about it and then we got into some solutions one of which was ironically just go back to alias based jails like the good old days but that's been a great conversation welcome your timing's perfect <laughs> so if there's um, nothing more about that go ahead Antrenig. but yeah uh on uh, other really, news yes um my uh my, my my company's infrastructure the public facing things of course are hosted on Vulture which have been huge for ABSD supporters for a long time. Uh, and um, uh, I mean, there has been some issues lately with their, uh, <laughs> there has been issues lately with their um, in terms of in terms of services. Yes. Um, apparently the parent, the parent company's lawyers 
change it to be like right. a very bad thing that said uh, uh, all the contents belong to us basically you know yep. and then i thought they backed the, the off lawyer oh yeah yeah of course they okay. absolutely did yeah 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 the, but then the, the um response made it almost worse because they kind of blamed oh this was only a, a form letter the junior guy who wasn't supposed to do that we used yes exactly yeah oh, wait, 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 why wait. do you have such an abusive form letter for him to even yeah. pick yeah what's wrong yeah. with you so this wasn't the first time you pulled this it's just yeah. the first time you got caught in a yes. storm or what mm. yes uh, but uh, yeah, overall, I mean, uh, luckily it, it got back. But no, uh, the, the longest story short, they have been huge FreeBSD supporters. And one of the things that I've bugged them for years was, um, let's say I have a machine, uh, a VM, or in our case, we use a lot of dedicated machines. Yeah. And I want to use jails, um, but I want each jail to have a real IP. So all of the cloud providers, what they do is that they route an IP to another IP. So let's say your jails IP is... 10, 10, 10, sorry, your host IP is 10, 10, 10, 10, uh, and your uh, extra IP is 10, 10, 10, 11. So what they would do is that they would route the 10, 10, 10, 11 to 10, 10, 10, 10, which means, uh, and if they are not in the same subnet, and most of the time they are not in the same subnet, um, you could not set a default gateway, basically, on your jail, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it was a, a huge... Let him finish. How? No, I really <laughs> want to know how first. You okay. okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, the way to do it, is, for example, a similar problem used to exist with IPv6 on Hetzner, and there okay. it was quite well documented because that's a common hoster in Europe. Yeah. And they had a started out with a pretty brain dead IPv6 deployment where the default gateway is not on your subnet. Uh huh. And your options are either to define an uh, indirect route with a in the ipv6 case with a link uh -huh. local next hop uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. or in the ipv4 case or the ipv6 uh, the next hop doesn't have to be an ip address it can also be a, an interface and mac address exactly exactly and, and that's that what works. we used to do for a long time and the other part is um these hosters often have networks which are not the working like your home Ethernet switch mm -hmm. works. They're not configured to be learning. Instead, they have a central control plane or a routing protocol, whatever you want to call that. Yes. Which does an IP to port and MAC mapping. So that they don't care if you have which MAC address you use. They ne will never learn a MAC address for your uh virtual machine they only care about basically this this customer port uh, is the just it's the next hop of the mm -hmm. last hop for yes. this in, uh, ip address so there is no uh, learning bridge in there instead it's a static mapping from uh and as, and as the port to uh, from ip address to port as in port on the network Yes. Not uh, so, on the protocol. So after a long time of pinging Volter about this, because like I just want to have a jail that can have its own gateway, right? Not a random gateway. Uh, now they have two networks types. They have VPC1 and VPC version 2. The VPC version 2 is now the fancy cloud thingy with, with all of the features where if you change the MAC address, you can't even access it anymore because it relies on these kind of things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a whole thing. But VPC1 is more like an older school switch. And now they actually have, well, I don't know if they did now or like two years ago, but last time I checked was three years ago. Uh, now they have a network where if you if you get a reserved IP for your jail, it will tell you, okay, so this IP address has this net mask and it has this as a gateway if you want to use it. If you don't, I mean, the packet is going to arrive. If you just listen to that IP, it will work fine anyway. So you can use either of the gateways that, that's assigned to you. 
which is a very nice way of doing this. And it also now works with IPv6. So in the last 22 hours, I want to say, I migrated all of my company's um, infrastructure to IPv6 and also each jail having its own IPv4 address, a public, publicly available IPv4 address, mm -hmm. which makes me think that currently for running a jail-based infrastructure, Vulter does seem to be the best place to run things. Uh, you can add as many IP, uh, reserved IPs that you want, which is not common in other providers. For example, on DigitalOcean, you'll still have a limitation of two extra IPs per host or a VM. Uh, they have dedicated machine that you can boot your own ISO on, which is really good if you want to, you know, install a custom version of FreeBSD. Like, for example, in our case, we also have Ocam BSD built Illuria operating system that we use, and we just boot that there. Uh, they also have IPXE, uh, which is also nice. So like, the, the, as th this is not a marketing. I mean, they haven't paid me or anything, you know? <laughs> uh, it's just that the, uh, of all of my customers, our first reaction is, okay, you want to use to a proper operating system, but you don't have a data center. You're okay with using the cloud. Everything is nice. But uh, most of the providers out there they don't care about, let's say, other operating systems. It's just like Windows or Linux, that's it. But in, in Walter's case, it's been nice that we can basically feel like we are renting hardware. That's what we're actually feeling like. We're basically renting hardware and we can do whatever we want. And the last bit that I learned is that the internal networks uh, in a data center, you know, in order to have an internal network between your machines, uh, are also built in a way that you can have uh, jails assigned any IP that you want in there. And it's basically an actual uh, bridge interface, you know, a vSwitch running inside the data center for that customer. And the beauty of that is, like, if you do the same with Azure, GCP, or uh, any of the fancy ones, uh, they will block per, per, per MAC address. So, like, your only solution would be is to not use a bridge or vnet jail you will need to go back to alias build uh, alias based networking except no. No. except if you use netgraph netgraphs gives the ability that when a packet is go when a frame is going out you can do like nat on the frame i don't know how that even sounds where it will mod where it will assign the mac address of the outgoing interface instead of the bridges interface which is or or, or the jails e pair interface which is kind of weird but that hack works on azure which is technically means that they are not rfc compliant but that's a whole other story that i'm still yeah. talking about it with microsoft uh, that's the long story short version of, of how we've been very happy with vultures um uh, ip uh, stack with mm -hmm. free bsd and dedicated um, compute. I, I, I'm going to interject here. You said something about Mac yes. and, and RFC compliance. Yes. That's what the I I'm, going, <laughs> I'm going to correct you in that it's Macs are, have nothing to do with the IETF or RFCs. That is oh, really? IEEE. Oh, sorry. IEEE 802 and those documentations and that's a that's a link layer it, it's con it this happens i mean there's the arp protocol that says how to get from a mac to an ip address but the mac space stuff is all in the as far as what is or isn't standards conformant is all controlled within the ieee documents oh okay and i believe that rewriting a mac is a completely legitimate operation i don't think there's anything in ieee that says you can't do that uh, yeah, uh, so uh, to bring, because I didn't want to go deep in there. So I told them that when I use NetGraph, where I overwrite the Mac in order to bypass your networking uh, limitations on Azure, it works fine. How about you just allow me to use any Mac address on that virtual machine? And their response was, that is not RFC compliant. I'm like, the RFC doesn't say anything about that. You're correct. You, you are yes. completely outside of the scope of anything the IETF or RFCs define. Yes. Uh, so I don't know I don't know who's smoking what at Azure, but I would love to smoke the same shit. <laughs> well, I would say it's it's 
it's probably security policy that restricts mm. that and that they don't want you to be able to spoof a Mac. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so um, though I would constrain that if these are bridges between tenant machines, they shouldn't give a shit what goes on on those In internal networks. Bridge those bridges because the, the, yes. those, there should be there should be no way that it can access anything. Um, now the policy should be different between a bridge that can access a different tenant or public internet versus a bridge between same tenant VMs. The policy, the security policy, should be different. The problem is pro that uh, in some of the control planes, they are limited in what they can do. Basically, the, because if they allow you to use arbitrary MAC addresses, then they have to implement a learning bridge, which has a whole, which is then a state synchronization problem and a scalability issue. Or they uh, have to allow you to configure arbitrary amounts of MAC addresses, which is explodes the state they actually have to pu push into the forwarding hardware. So I can see where it becomes a problem to have lots of MAC addresses per virtual machine because it forces the, the forwarding engines to track more state, which is uh, expensive. I have a question. No, no it's um, not expensive. The, 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 oh. the forwarding computation in, in an ethernet bridge, which is trivial. I mean, no, it's we, not. We used to do it. We used to do it on eight-bit microprocessors at ten megabits. The computation it, isn't expensive. Having the the memory to track the state in the forwarding engine. If suddenly a virtual machine doesn't have one MAC address but a hundred, you need the MAC address tables in hardware in this special memory module in your forwarding engine. That's the part which becomes expensive. Not the computation, that the simple lookup key value, that's trivial. But synchronizing this, and, and this, this stuff isn't that going state. this isn't going to the Mac table of a physical device. It's the Mac table of the software bridge on the virtual host on the, the hosting platform. Again, trivial amounts of memory. I mean, you could you could put a table size limit, just like a real switch does, of of a thousand twenty four entries or four thousand ninety six entries, and just be done with it. It's a trivial amount of memory. It's a trivial amount of for, research. For a server, it is. If you have a some kind of vendor provided hardware engine in your top of rack switch, because you're delegating it to there, then it becomes an issue. If you do it in the packet processing and software on the hypervisor, then there's no excuse because there you have so much memory. Well, again, we were talking about links between the virtual machine. I don't know why it would ever leave a hypervisor. Antonik, what's your question? Well, My question I is. Yes. Okay. Hopefully. On FreeBSD, yeah. is there a way to do Mac overwriting when the frame is going out without using NetGraph? Because when we were using jails, we were we were only able to figure out how to how to do that either with alias jails or with um, NetGraph. Uh, when you do an alias jail, obviously it's on the interface, so it would use the MAC address. That's very uh, obvious. Or when you're doing NetGraph, there's a bit that you can flip in the uh, configuration with NGCTL that will do the um, MAC address uh, overwriting. But let's say I'm not using jails, nor I'm using uh, NetGraph. Let's say I'm using um, a virtual machine, for example, uh, or, or anything else, literally. Is there a way in like PF or IPFW or in the system uh, CCTLs to tell, hey, when the packet is going out of an interface, yes, the spoofing thing. Uh, to always do that. It wouldn't even be spoofing. It would just be Mac source address selection or overriding. Yes. Uh, it yeah. wouldn't be any form of malicious spoofing. It's just overriding the default selection. So the hacky way I can immediately think of would be to use ng underscore patch 
which is probably what you've already discovered. Uh, there, yeah, there's also there's the ng patch way, and there's also ng either ie ether or ng ether. One of these two adapters have like a flip in it that you can change, okay. and it will do it automatically. Uh, but it was one of the. But yeah, it, it the, the, that part can also be done on the net. RTFW has the well. p mod uh, additional kernel module. I don't know if it can do that uh, and how flexible it is, or if it can only do TCP uh, MSS clamping. Sorry, P mod, P M O P M O D. Yeah. P M O D. Uh, I don't okay. know how flexible it is, but it would probably be the way to do it with a PFIO hook. You may have to configure IPFW to operate at layer two for that to work. I see. So and anything, can... anything with PF, we are a PF shop. And Throw it away. And... <laughs> what? Uh, let's port 7.4, okay? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Did PF hurt you, young man? No, it's just um the I mean, I mean, I mean, PF or four. I mean, uh D Dan wrote a couple of days ago or a week ago that what was the longest update that you've done? And like a week ago, we upgraded a university uh, router from FreeBSD 7 or 8 Goodness. to 14. Yeah. But that was not the hard part. The other Doubling part was the version that, number. <laughs> yeah. The, the other part was that they were using IPF. Not IPF, but no, IPF. Mm -hmm. And like we had to move a lot of rules from IPF to IPFW. So that was actually very much fun. Uh... It's, it, it was very similar to the IPF in Solaris. I, I don't know. Is it like an exact port of the IPF in Solaris that they brought back in the day? I don't know. I don't know the history of that. But yeah, the syntax was very familiar to IPFW and the Illumos IPF. Uh, fun process. Uh, not recommended. If you want. If, if you want. No, sorry. Wrong story. I was trying to relate IPF, IP filter and IPF. IPF uh, should really uh, have been decommissioned several major releases ago, but every time it comes up, uh, one or two people uh, wake up from the slumber and fix the problem so that it builds again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of pieces of stuff. Someone wanted to decommission Ness, and I'm like, no, we're still using it. Like, no, we're well, still um, using this. Yeah, well, I've talked to someone at the Chaos uh, Communication Camp where I said, yeah, well, we are still using, um, um, yeah, um, Chaos as the address family for DNS. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Uh, we put it all in DNS back then, and FreeBSD used to support that, but you could use, what's the name for it, where you basically use uh, DNS instead of NIST with the uh, chaos address family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, with DNSSEC, it's actually secure these days, mm -hmm. yeah. if you validate that on the host. So it was a potentially tempting way to replicate stuff, because you could just use uh, keep the DNS cache uh, pre-populated. Yeah. But uh, yeah, everything uh, is throwing that, that out. Uh, most Linux just ripped it out years ago. FreeBSD re removed it, I think, in 13. That's actually a very nice trivia question for network engineers, where we say, if you do dig com, it brings the NS records of uh, .com. But if you do dig ch, it brings nothing. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's true. Why is it not bringing anything? And like they don't see it's not the inet address family. It's the ch address family. And the, that's a very cute uh, trivia if you want to make a network engineer feel very sad. Well, pull up, pull up. We're into trivia. Antrenik, does this give you enough to test over the weekend? Yes. Not bother uh, the users. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I told my users that I will be uh, making the server offline for the weekend where I will be doing updates, upgrades, etc. And also there's a new Omni OS out. So I'm going to be doing that as well and updating our local mirror. And I might get some extra funding to have a local mirror of um, FreeBSD in Armenia, at least for ISOs and packages and, you know, base and et cetera. But I'm not sure if we can do it official because network bandwidth is like capped at 500 meg. Uh, we actually need a gigabit per the um, uh, infrastructure teams, uh, cluster admin, sorry, the, for the cluster admin uh, standards. Uh, but maybe we'll get there and have a, a local mirror in Armenia as well. Um, cool. uh, we'll, I'll be doing that. I'll be doing all of these tests. And another test that I'm looking forward to is um, integrating Yon's um, scripts of package base into Jailer. I'm going to be freezing Jailer uh, on 0 0.1.3, which will be the Jailer for FreeBSD 13. And after that is going to be for FreeBSD 14. Uh, which will include the package base features as well as the uh, dot include. I just finished dot include. Everything's working fine and very nicely. I took Dan's um, recommendation of listing disabled jails and the way that they are disabled if their file name is you know not dot conf but dot conf dot disabled. Right. So like okay, that's a jail. You should know about it, but it is disabled, dear jailer. Uh, and lastly, another. Th Thing that we had a look into a, in our team meeting for Jailer was, oh yeah, uh, now we have Jailer init registry, which will create a registry, which is basically an SQLite database and um, SQLite database and an Nginx directory where we would be putting like ZFS exports into there and it will be acting as a registry and you can just pull from there or from another machine. Uh, uh, of course, people ask me, oh, uh, OCI and stuff. I'm like, no, 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 we're not doing OCI. We're just going like tarballs and that's it. So uh, that's the long story short version. And you're on the of, schedule for next week for a massive report on all that. Congratulations. Thank Anything you. Anything else relating to that? Yes. Um, I was uh, slowed down the last two weeks because... Um, the FreeBSD package base repositories were uh, corrupted on yeah. the official okay, MRS. Okay, do tell, yes. Uh, we, we mentioned that uh, last yep. week. So the, this is some fallout from changes in package version 2.21, where uh, one environment variable is no longer leaked, but that uh, broke uh, the make package uh, target in base, so that you got a package annotated with a FreeBSD version uh, ABI number of zero for the kernel and its debug yep, symbols, yep. which then, of course, package said, no, I'm not. It's updating rep repository containing packages for FreeBSD ABI version number zero. That's obviously uh, corrupted. And afterward, they fix that. But then there were some packages missing which, but the ones depending on them were there. So it just said, well, I have a missing dependency. Okay. Is it fixed? Yes. Uh, Did you fix it? As of the, well, I reported it. I don't have right access to the relevant systems. Okay. <laughs> and obtaining that would be a, a <laughs> would be a criminal case. <laughs> a curse in our case. Hmm. Hmm? Yeah. Um, it, would so, be, um, it would be a curse. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, so now um, I have that figured out that the idea is that you would just do a package fetch uh, once because if you use base uh, packages, you probably need them all on your host anyway. So the idea is that you can just use package fetch dash A uh, dash R to fetch them all into a local uh, ZFS file system and then uh, either a snapshot and clone it or uh, nullfs mount it into a jail so that the jail has a local uh, FreeBSD uh, base system repository, which uh, cuts down on all the package fetching and validation overhead because it's already in the package cache if you're doing it a bit hacky. Um, and the other part is that now I've, that I've figured out how to um, 
in-band signal the end of the stream, uh, I can give a short demonstration of how I can use that to run my uh, jails with fancy ASCII art uh, and package base. And basically now what I'm doing is I'm uh, using package base to populate the initial jail, snapshot it, create read-only clones so that they don't diverge and thereby lock information away. Then I take the packages, uh, do the same again. So now I have basically the uh, base system and a package set and some initial configuration for that. I do it again. And then I create the persistent uh, data ZFS file systems. And that's where I finally get to run it. So that I can deduplicate both the uh, the base system and the package set. Have you published anything new for the rest of us, or is it just in the minutes? No, I just uh, during the call, I fixed the bug I ran into Ooh. on Sunday. Okay, so, uh, that's worth it. Uh, yeah. Jan, when when you're done with all of these, please write a blog post on yeah. like how to use package so based can, for the jail. If I can uh, take uh, the screen away from Michael for a second. Let me first get these words in. Yeah, go for it. Um, I hope I picked the right screen. <laughs> do you see a terminal window in my side? Yes, uh, we do. Is that a sane resolution for most of you? I'm fine with it. OK, so. Uh, OK, that wasn't that clever of me. Uh, and until you do that, uh, Rod, do you know the internals of NS switch? The internals of what? NS switch or NS dispatch. Are we talking about NIS? No, NS switch, the the NSS the switch. Yes. Which is used uh, for like LDAP and uh, NES and everything in between. No, no. Okay. What's your question? Uh, what do you want to change? Um, the longer story short version is there is a, a, a source called files, which reads from the files, such as etc password, etc hosts, etc group, etc. Mm -hmm. I would like to add another source called local, which does the exact same thing, but reads from user local etc password, user local etc host, um, user local there etc. There are ports which can read from various types of files. I think one of them reads it's a pure NSS, but does not provide passwords because it comes from Linux. And mm -hmm. there's another one which can read, I think, from a Berkeley DB 1.85 file and another one for a DJB constant database, okay. uh, which, so it can be done. Uh, and if not, the code in them should give you an example, or you could just take the one out of Libc. Yeah, right, that's right. what I was planning to do. Just take so the one I'm out of right Libc. Here, yeah. Oh, there we go. Uh, is um, I'm installing my jail. Uh, third CDL takes uh, most of the runtime. So this is a reduced FreeBSD uh, 14 system. So if we here, uh, I used uh, Jamie's uh, new dot include feature to the maximum to share implementations. So I have uh, the common stuff to how to install a jail from package base um, using a local directory. Then uh, this here defines what to take from the base system. So what it does is uh, it assigns a name for this uh, set of base system packages and then a package query to uh, take everything with FreeBSD dashed in the beginning, which does not match uh, one of these uh, patterns. These are uh, shell-style blobs. So 
They're not that expressive, but they're expressive enough. I uh, deselected B as an MP because it has a dependency on the tests for some reason, which is like 17 megabytes. Uh, and I don't need it. Can we look at the size with DU, with DU dash A capital? Yes. Uh, let me do it like this first. Okay. So, um, and the logical, yes, sorry. So, Max, uh, DU, let's test that as well. Uh, Yeah, nice. Plus my. So, uh, but I can don't have to do that. I can install the full system as well quickly. Mm -hmm. Nice. So this is so now I'm, I uh, implemented a little helper because otherwise uh, you get drowned out here uh, mm -hmm. with four hundred lines of installing package. Mm -hmm. And so I, if the standard out is a TTY, instead it pipes it through SED to inject. Um, control sequence to delete the line and move back up so that you only see the last line of the package installation. Uh, if you pipe it or redirect it to anything but a TTY, uh, it self disables this feature. Um, now I have uh, reduced the default base system. So let's use that to um, do this. So here again, I'm pulling in, in this case, I'm pulling in from quarterly, uh, the normal packages from ports and I'm snapshotting it all. So if I stop this jail, the next time I start it, it's a lot faster because uh, the expensive steps, the package installation and not that it's expensive, but it needs a writable file system. Um, the configuring the RC.D services um, get skipped. And if we scroll up a bit, we can see that uh, before it took the snapshot, it detected that uh, I had the write once data set slash etc and var db package, which then get changed to read only so that the snapshot is of a read only file system. And it stays like that. So the and, uh, initial uh, mounting here um, is smart enough, this code here, to figure out that um, it should set this file system to read only off because they are write once. So when the snapshot does not exist to tag the jail as completely initialized, the template, the file systems are mounted writable. If it's done, the file systems are post start, they get remounted to read only. And from then on, they stay read only. And uh, Jan, uh, what kind of networking do you have on this jail? Right now, just inherit because I'm not working on the I networking. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to get the package and bootstrapping problem solved first. The mm -hmm. idea is that I you can just dot include the networking you want yeah. and then define the uh, right uh, variables, similar to how I do it for the uh, file systems mm -hmm. already, that I ha mm -hmm. just have reserved variable names, which bec have meaning to the uh, jail.conf snippets I mm -hmm. include. Uh, and um, Jan, can, can you show us an update process from uh, either a patch level or, I mean, I, th I think you can't do major level right now. Uh, 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 maybe next week when 14.1 uh, comes out. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I can I can downgrade the base. Let's oh. just do that. I can do go to 14.0 uh, 14 P5 or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and what happens then, let's, let me do this. Instead, maybe that's more interesting and it, because it exercises even more than what you're uh, asking, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say I have my here. So right now, 
these are the two versions I have defined of Minio. Mm -hmm. So um, if I go here into the instance, then instead I change this here mm -hmm. to the older one. Oh, I can still stop the jail. Not that one, the other one. Wait, why does it? Let me check what's there. Did I have a typo in there? You have a typo in here. The, mm -hmm. the, the, sl the slash, oh, the slash missing. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the one I want instead. Oh, I repeated not just the, I repeated the uh, service name, not just the, mm -hmm. that okay, that's uh, just use error. And now I can st still stop the jail. Um, run mount for file systems, I'm parsing the jail-p output in, uh, with shell built in, so not even a sub process is fault for that. Uh, and now I can start it again. And unless I broke something, it just switched over all the clones. It destroyed the stale clones, which are mm -hmm. not from the same origin, the correct origin. So if we go through it here, it found out that, okay, this here is correct. This is a unmountable parent data set, just so that I can have a child inherit the right mount point. Mm -hmm. Uh, then here are the per uh, category of data uh, FreeBSD file system, so base, persistent data, and packages. And then it creates a, um, found that all the um, empty unmountable file systems belonging to that jail uh, exist. Then, okay, the the data um, ones which are part of the jail state exists, but then now it found out, oh, wait, I have clones. But the clones are from the wrong origin because the uh, version of the template, in the end, that's a, a snapshot. So it is an origin. It compares the origin of the inferior uh, clones, uh, destroys them, and then says, okay, I had to wipe those out. Uh, and any snapshots under them as well because you can't create a file system, uh, destroy a file system while there are snapshots of that file system. Because of that, I have twice as many uh, data sets to destroy as there are file systems. So then it clones the six um, new uh, clones, uh, takes a snapshot of the read-only clone with the tag of the version I'm running, and then it mounts all of it by going through all the jails uh, file systems sorted by mount point, filtering out those which are unmountable and then mounting them in uh, in lexical order of mount point. So which will we see first, a blog post or a talk at EuroBSDCon, the CFPS <laughs> When I've pasted the link about five different times. Yeah. Good work, man. Keep it coming. Yeah, I okay. have to stabilize it because now it's basically I have my proof of concept uh, in non-trivial jail is working. Make it so. And did you find that BSNMP was depending on tests? Was that a bug? I don't think it's a bug. I, I think some of the it really uses some of the code from tests. Really? Okay. It, it's a reference there. Uh, Double check it. Um, yeah. It's Anything a else on your demo? Show. Not really. Okay. Um, any questions uh, about this insanity of doing it with just uh, binsh and jail.conf? Does anyone want to uh, look under the hood and. Uh, Jamie, is he holding it right for dot include? I've. 
I muted you earlier. I think there was like. Uh, uh, what I'm doing here is, for example. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, Jan, where's uh, your include dot include heavy lifting? Uh, there is. Okay, so uh, my etc gel dot conf looks like this. And Jamie, I what I still would like to have something like this or very close to it go into base as default, so that going forward there's no need to have any merge conflicts there. Hmm. Is that a fourteen dot one topic? That's no. I think that should have said it's probably a fifteen because people want to get a heads up. Mm. Yeah, mm. but it's like five lines. Exactly. My point exactly. <laughs> and it's not like you're going to get a merge conflict with a non-existing file. Exactly. So, um, exactly. In that case, but this is the starting point for uh, interchangeable gel.conf uh, snippets because it gives you a structure where you can put things so that they become part of the default configuration so that you don't have to provide a dash f my gel.conf path and so that even more important dependency tracking works because dependency tracking between jails only works when they are defined in the same gel.conf context with includes supported, but if you have a per jail uh, jail.conf like you had to have before 14, um, unless you sumlink the same conf file multiple times and thereby destroy the utility again, or at least partition your jails into dependency sets, uh, you can't use dependencies at the jail level. So jail dash R won't stop the once this depending on this jail before it stops the jail and jail dash C won't start the dependencies before that. Instead, we are C dot D script had to reinvent this wheel. So now that we have this, uh, let's have a look here. Um, so um, for package base, I have my uh, package base conf, which is broken up into the global defaults to include. Oh, well, maybe I should start with a concrete example. So this is how my uh, full free BSD 14 patch level six jail definition looks. It includes the configuration for a package base, then specifies the set of packages and the version. So if we go down so that the relative paths match, we can have a look here. So that just defines version numbers. That defines a very simple query. So Michael, what's that? Not for you. Okay. Continue. I was just confused. Um, so, uh, and the package base, uh, Con, so that includes defaults common to all jails. Instead of having to put them outside of jail, I can uh, invert the relationship and have each jail, now that this file is included into a jail block, load its own uh, defaults so that I can override them in the jail without changing the global ones. Uh, so it's a question of variable scoping. And the, these hooks uh, implement and the nice uh, box drawing around each uh, exec hook. Then uh, this here is so that I have support for uh, the right variables so that I can just say this is the FS tab uh, content. So this is not the path to an FS tab, but this variable, for example, is the contents of the FS tab. And it's built up by just concatenating variables. Uh, one per line. So, um, and here is an example of how I use uh, a name prefix for variables. So this here defines the CFS snapshot, uh, which is used to tag this. And so what, do you want anything uh, to go before that? Uh, I can sh cut this short here. 
Yeah, cut it short, if you will. Rod's got to go. I want to hear from him briefly on his WAN buffer sizing. And yep. great work. I look forward to your blog post or your, your OBSD con talk or both. Thank you very much. So, uh, and if you're wondering, that was the best Google translation to blog, blog post, please. <laughs> Armenian, <laughs> German, and Russian, which is like, please post a blog post. So, Blogging stuff, bitte. Yet. So, uh, please post a review for this syntax you've been mentioning, because that would be a perfect segue from 14.0 to 14.1. Thank you very much. And I'm not convinced it'll be next week, but hopefully after the Dev Summit. One last question. Happens. Yes, uh, Jan, since you're keeping like MinIO and Postgre directories, but the destroying the base system, does that mean that if you create a user in the base system, then it will be gone in the next one. I'm assuming that's right. Um, right? That depends on how you do it. Uh, you, okay. And where, where, the, where, where which data set belongs. I have a one step which I haven't packaged in this, which would take care of it. But uh, let's put that to the end because what is the time pressure? Okay. okay. Thank Rodney, you. have you found God's own frame buffer size for a certain monopoly in the United States for WAN communication? Well, I, <laughs> I had discussed or mentioned, I think it was in this call in the past, yes, about the in-flight size and dealing with what are called long, fat networks um, and the evolution of home connectivity uh, business connectivity over the, over the time and that we're now seeing gigabit connections into um in notes consumers and stuff and those gigabit connections um are exceeding the default tcp stack parameters in most operating systems um since then, I think Michael's got my latest set of numbers that are posted above, which are my recommendations for for um, people on Comcast or, uh, and particularly on Comcast Xfinity on cable mode networks, um, to be able to get above about seven hundred megabits a second. You probably don't need those if you're on CenturyLink or some other. Um, GPON fiber-based system because you don't have the 16 milliseconds of latency. Um, so this would be doubling the defaults from two to four megabytes. Yes, basically the current defaults of two megabytes for the for the socket buffers and and the receive and send buffers um, leads to a window scale of six, and um, that. Buffering only allows your congestion window to get to about 1.6 megabytes in size, which is is if you do it at 16 milliseconds, I think it's 650 megabits a second. There's there's a formula that you can run these through that um, basically tells you what kind of speed you're going to get at different delays. Um, it's just divide the buffer size by the throughput, and you should get the time. Right. And that it affects our ability to, to well, I shouldn't say this only applies to Xfinity people. Let me rephrase that. If you're on gigabit connectivity and you're trying to shove data across the United States, round trip time across the United States is around 35 milliseconds. And actually to do gigabit across the United States, these numbers need to double again to eight mag. These numbers are good to, I think it's good to 22 milliseconds. Yep. For people like me that shove data in large quantities internationally now, Grand's Atlantic, uh, I'm not sure which way the packets are going. I'm, I'm moving data in and out of a Fremont data center into Switzerland, it's 170 millisecond ping time. And to be able to get even to 850 megabits a second, you got to have 16 megabytes in flight. Per um, connection. 
per connection. Right. So that means socket buff needs to go to 16 megabytes. And the receive buff and the send buff need to go to 16 megabits or megabytes. That's to do you that's to do to be able to handle gigabit speeds across what I will call half a globe, basically. And um that leads to a window scale, I think, of eight eight. And I got interested just to get a glimpse a little bit of what the default window scales are and some different operating systems. Um and basically captured some SIN SIN act packets across one of my routers. And I see everything from uh well not using window scale, which means you're on a 65k byte window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, still in use. It, it, interesting yes, thing. Uh, and it, quite I, common a, a, a quick peek into that data. Most most of those connections are nefarious people probing the internet. So a real good way to a real good way to drop all, everybody's TCP connections that's trying to probe the internet is you just drop every TCP SIN packet that has a no W scale option in it. Hmm. Um, the problem <laughs> is that it's also a consequence of using um, Mac based uh, TCP SIN cookies so that you can defect defend no. against no SIN hmm. cookies do not cause W scale to not be there. No, no, but uh, using the stateless ones where you just take uh, the source IP address and uh, a sin, temporary a sin, key. A SIN cookie cannot affect the initial SIN. It can only affect the SIN act. Yep. The, the W scale has to be present in the SIN packet to be used. Yes. So how can sand cookies have anything to do with the requested W scale? Because uh, the because then when it's finally uh, left let in because there is a slot available, the original incoming sun has not been saved because that would have required allocating state. Instead, it's recreated from the uh, tag from the sun cookie which does not have enough bits to encode that state correctly, if I remember correctly. No, so that... do you actually have to, you actually have to store the W scale presented in the SAN. In to the do SAN. it correctly, but firewalls sometimes don't do that and claim that it's a safety and performance feature. Hmm. So, so that, uh, that would be, yeah, but that, that doesn't explain why my incoming ones are missing it. No, but it's no... not just the attackers who do that. All right. Anyway, they range you... everywhere from yep. no W scale to 10 is the highest I've seen, <laughs> which is, that's a scale of, no, that's not 10 megabytes. That's a scale oh. of 10, which is 2 to the 10th times oh. 65536. It's 2 to the 10th, 2 up arrow 10, yeah. up arrow 10 times 65535. Which I guess I it's a big number. Okay, yep. fine. I think that's and, uh hundred and finish. Really? On what device do you recall? I do not know what who was sending that. Okay, cool. I mean it was just it came from some IP accessing something inside of my autonomous system. Cool. Um, Did you get a chance to also I'm sorry, uh, you you have your own ASN? Yes. Oh well, yeah. I Which actually, one is it? Uh, 10494 is one of them. Well, I mean, as a person or as an organization? Yes. Well, I, actually, as a person now. <laughs> How? I mean, I don't think Ripe does that. No. Oh, but in, in, in App, is it APNIC in the US? No. no it, sponsoring Leo and uh, Ripe. It, it came about that way. Just because of history, it was originally an organization ID that belonged to a corporation. Okay. But through the fact that the corporation dissolved its assets and all assets became my personal property, <laughs> Hayron didn't have much of a choice when it came to push, came to shove to clean some records up and everything. And so they they actually registered at, if you look at it, it says 
uh, Rodney Grimes, a sole proprietorship is the ASN registration for it. Anyway, wow, completely way off topic. The the two two to the tenth is sixty four megabytes window size, and I'm seeing those come from somebody. I suspect that's probably coming um, out of a either a 6.9 Linux kernel or potentially some Microsoft stuff. But the number what? makes sense. This number now today makes sense. I'm running just, just to be able to do Europe to the US, I have to run a two to the ninth. Yeah, that's not an unreasonable number if you have it. It won't even allow you to separate a 10 gig wide area link. So, right, right. And that's that's why I'm, I think we're seeing these two to the tenth numbers. I am trying to put together some data to take a proposal to the um, weekly TCP transport group and FreeBSD and get our numbers tweaked up. So we're at least at two to the eighth, if not two to the ninth. Um, two, two, two to the two to the eighth makes sense for um, uh, on continent gigabit blanks. Is there any support in FreeBSD to basically put in routes and then put the attributes on the inside the route information base? So that you could have picked good defaults by destination address. I do and not believe you... that there's anything in the route cache for window scale. I was more thinking about a user space part, which adds uh, aliasing routes uh, with the route information. Uh, I know that you can do the uh, path MTU per route, but maybe we have to think about adding basically the window scale i don't even i don't even know if we cache the path mtu anymore do we we don't cache it uh, i think but because the the caching layer was a uh, flawed idea this uh, what was it called slow cache or something um intent that never worked out as intended Any anyway there's I mean, we have like the dynamic window growth code is in there and everything. So, so mm -hmm. cranking these numbers up is not as bad as some people would think because you don't actually, just because you set max socket buffer to 32 megabytes does not mean every socket you're going to create is going to use 32 megabytes. Only when you're in one of these long delay scenarios. Then well, the congestion. Let him finish. Let them finish. Well, the window grow to 32 megabytes to where you're going to use that much buffer space. Normally, typically, local land traffic and stuff uses a little teeny 64K buffer or 128K buffer, and that's all it needs. The window size is really small. But anyway. Hmm. Is there any harm with the large setting? In theory, it could impact large servers that are having lots of international connections to them because they're going to mm. eat a whole bunch of socket buffer up. I, if I was running a web server in the United States that had thousands of connections per minute coming in from Europe and I was serving out large amounts of data, it, it, it could eat my buffers up. Hmm. It, so, it could be a good idea. Sorry that I uh, got in because I'm not a very much expert in this. Back in the day when WhatsApp was a tiny, small company that everyone loved, they used to publish all of their tuning configuration on their blogs and their uh, even during their BSD talks. Mm -hmm. um, it might be a good idea to also ask uh, Netflix that, hey, I mean, all of the work is being upstream, but can you also uh, maybe do mm -hmm. like a single detailed Most gist of your tunings as well? Most of the guys uh, in the transport call are, in fact, Netflix employees. <laughs> so um, Netflix doesn't really care about high-performance FreeBSD servers used for multiple te tenants and so on, or even multiple services per server. 
Um, but for those, it could probably be a good idea to add support to track the total buffer size for all sockets accepted from a listening socket. So that on I, your for your big server, you would yeah. have a sock up to set. I've got a, like, I've got a simpler statistic that I want to actually add to collect, and that's I I simply want to know how often my kernel hits the upper tune limit. In other words, how often do I hit max socket buffer? Okay. It, um, that's all I really care about. I mean, if 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 you're not running up against that number, you don't need to do any tuning. But if you're hitting that, if you're hitting that upper limit a lot, you you need to tune your machine. Another yes question. No. Um, um, that just describes your uh, normal state. But if an attacker knows that you're doing that and now has an easy way to trick you to tie down all that memory and thereby staff everything of memory but the socket buffers um, that becomes an attack vector huh. a denial of service so, it, so for to be an effective attack buffer the consumer has to have that much buffer space i mean they're, they're going to take that bandwidth to them it's just not a it's not a reasonable attack vector okay I mean, I mean, it, it's they can, yeah, they they would have to keep the flow going to be any effective amount. I mean, they might be able to put, could they even get? No, they wouldn't. They they would have to sustain the flow to get the congestion window to grow because you got to remember the congestion window is going to start out small and slow start down at at twenty nine k bytes or something like that, ten packets. Mm -hmm. it's 15k byte. So unless they process and act that and keep all the sequence numbers going and everything, it's not going to be, there's no way that they're going to drive me up without. Okay. Uh, so another, uh, another question, uh, if I may. Um, uh, Rod, are those calls part of the FreeBSD project or the IEEE? The TCP well, calls? These, Weekly these, TCP yeah, calls. Oh, the week the, the transport calls. That's FreeBSD project. Oh, okay. it's called the are transport the, working group. Transport working group. Okay. Are those open uh, to other members? Yeah, I believe so. Okay, because uh, we also uh, are we also post we also have a calendar link that Michael manages, and I also post the links in our FreeBSD Discord group, which is like easily the most active group of the community. Uh, way more active even than okay. IRC. Uh, maybe it would be a good idea to post the link of the call and the dates into there as well, so people would know uh, if there's calls like that. We, uh, Michael, we've had some people who came here from the Discord calls, right? Oh yeah, well that was popular. I will admit that. But let's talk uh, social media interaction. I Sorry. do want to know if those calls are um, actually generally open one... and are they like recorded so we can benefit without having to like. Uh, they're not recorded. Mm. Bummer. Mm. Um, and they're not even minutes written. A question. Are you in a position and did you have a chance to uh, compare different uh, congestion control uh, algorithms for uh, long fat pipes? What do you mean compare congestion? I'm, I'm not doing any te testing on congestion control on these long fat pipes, no. I didn't even okay. I did I could I could look to see what the if the ECN bits are set in the Sim Sin Act to see if ECN's even being negotiated. But most of my testing is between my machine, so I know ECN's running. Um but I do um, not I don't I mean we're talking about you know 15 hops across the internet. I got no idea what the AQMs are in place. I do know that that's... I'm if I get in a situation where any retry occurs during my operational testing, I throw the data out. Be okay, because FreeBSD has and have had since a while different congestion control algorithms you can implement uh, and pick. I think even per socket. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Only I'm one. not. I do not. I'm not trying to test congestion control. I'm trying to find the, the, the specifically on this topic. I'm simply trying to find the correct. TCP stack parameters so that we can get enough flight data in flight to actually be mm -hmm. able to use people's gigabit network connections yeah. at home. I mean, the atypical user on a cable connection at home can't get much more than about 400 megabits per second out of a free BSD box 
accessing things oh, over Xfinity or Comcast simply because they can't get enough data in fly. Mm -hmm. Not on Thank you, Rodney, and I know your time is limited. Are we yeah. at your... The receive buffer is too small. Mm. Oh, by the way, the default on Windows 10 is 9. Oh, interesting. I'm pretty sure it's 9. I think that's what I... I'd have to... Believe to be... Make it believed to be 9. Yeah, two to... Do you have a simple script for testing that or where are you watching? Because, you know, I've got hardware coming out of my ears. If I know what to look for, I'm happy to look for it. Where I'm testing for these data values? Yeah. What, what... Oh, that's a TCP dump. Okay, got it. On on a on a router, you know. <laughs> I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, if I'm you just on back finish. Router. Okay. If you want to uh, do this kind of analysis on production traffic, you can probably use uh, either a PF log with just enough to catch uh, relevant headers uh, or a PFW logging uh, over uh, a dedicated no. logging it's... interface. Or you can do, if you want to pre filter it more uh, detailed, you can use NetGraph. Well, BPF. TCP dump is the excellent tool for doing this. You're only going to capture two packets of a connection, and you only care about the first 40 bytes of that packet, 60 bytes, 60 bytes of that packet. So it's a really yeah. small, it's a small capture. Hmm. It's it's tiny because all you care about is the send and the send app, because that's where these flags are. I mean, it's here. I can. I. I don't even have it stored in a script file. I just type it in. It's too simple. Drop it in chat, please. This is the common one that's running on a router. I mean, literally, all you're going to capture is sin and sin act packets, and then the W scales will or will not be in those. And I, you could, Michael, actually, if you want to, you could run that on your uh, open sense box on your outside interface and see what your what kind of W uh, W scales you're getting. And anybody that has a BSD based router, they could capture it that same way. Did I drop? No, you didn't. Okay. I just, it was silent. Like, but, this uh, never silent. But Andrinik and others, I think, dropped. Um, you're the hero, uh, Dan and Michael, and yeah, that's it. I'm back. I have to run, sorry to say. And Antrenig had to drop. Are you still recording? Uh, yes, I am. So, uh, I have, I have one minor thing. Yes, please. Uh, Net management slash net SNMP had an update rate lately on FreeBSD. It now runs as non root. This may break things for you. Could you drop the name of that? Uh, yeah. Port in the chat, please. How does it? A fancy name. How can net SNMP run as non root? It just runs as the SNMPD user. Ah, there you go. Thank you. Yeah, and but it collects a data that should only be accessible to root. Guess what? 
<laughs> your data goes away. <laughs> All right. I, don't, I mean, there's not very much data that it gets out that it would need root to get out. I don't know. Go and, go and have a look at the commit message. Well, the, the problem is, is SN, net SNMPD can get arbitrary data. I mean, it can fork a shell and get data from shell scripts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it, it heavily depends upon what the user is doing with. Yeah. With net SNMP, whether it creates a problem for them or not, I would think that the standard networking MIB data and stuff probably can all be obtained without privilege. Yep. So Just I don't think it, it probably won't break very many people. Broke broke some stuff for me, but that's okay. I got it. What type of stuff did it break for you? Did it break script related stuff that that SNMP was spawning? Yes. Okay. That's that would be my first inkling to go that yeah, that's a bad idea because of that. So basically instead of having it extends and then a script name, it would be extends sudo script name. And for a lot of And you and you have to put then you have to put the user SNMP in the sudo's file. Yep. Which kind of completely Obliterates the idea of having it not run it through. Not really. Uh, if the script is not owned by that user, uh, you can have a script owned, for example, by root, and then allow it only to run this script that cannot modify with elevated privileges yeah, yeah. and with a sanitized environment. So it's not as bad as running it as an unrestricted I, root process. I'm Pretty sure that the SN, the shell spawned by SNMP is already sanitized. Even when it was yeah. running as root, if you put if you wrote shell scripts in it, you got a, a sanitized environment. A lot of this stuff is a perfect example for why you want Capsicum or and why it's such a shame that uh, Cloud ABI died. Yeah. All right. Good heads up, Dan. You're welcome. Thanks for a warning. Yes, indeed. A, a recent commit this... allows you to still run it as non-root. By default, it will run as root as non-root. Um, there's a there's a flag that allows you to continue running it as root. But if if you upgrade, it will start running as non-root. Okay. But you'll find out close enough, soon enough. And this is yeah. this is in the next port right. quarterly, right? Yes, it's on that now. Oh, it's there now. It's in the quarterly. Yeah. Okay. So okay, uh, the summary from the uh, review says that it's now compiled without def kmem access, which is a good idea, unless you really really need it. On that note, we covered a lot and, of ground and I thank you for it. Uh, I need to run <laughs> and free up the Zoom link. <laughs> Bye. Take Bye. care, everyone. It's been a pleasure and uh, like and subscribe.